Okay, we are live and welcome to another um, episode of our neuromodulation um, uh, podcast. And we're delighted uh, this time to have um, uh, Professor Helen Mayberg, uh, professor uh, at ICANN School of Medicine at uh, Mount Sinai in, in New York. Thanks so much for being here, Helen. Looking forward to chatting to you. And perhaps you'd kick off by giving us a, a, a short sort of uh, summary of your, your own background and your own um, trajectory uh, leading you into this field. So I'm on paper a medical doctor. I'm a neurologist by training, um, born and raised in California, and basically have been a nomad scientifically since um, I finished medical school and an internship in, um, in Los Angeles. Um, I trained in neurology and then did a fellowship in nuclear medicine and really spent the first half of my career really looking at the neurology of depression. I, I pretty much was confused about what I wanted to be when I grew up. I came from a family of doctors and scientists and had some amazing role models in my late father and my uncle who was a scientist and nuclear medicine um, clinician scientist. But that I was always conflicted about interested in the brain, but conflicted about how to study it and going into medicine or science versus being an artist or a musician was a writer was always a constant tug of war for me, but um, basically gravitated towards science. And again, couldn't really decide what to do once I was in medical school, except I was interested in the brain and I'm kind of old and it was pretty early days and how you actually studied the brain in those days, even as a clinician was descriptive, but neurology was the most objective way to study the brain, understand the brain. You pretty much deconstructed the brain like an engineer would. And I think it's pretty funny now that I do neuromodulation if I'd actually had any engineering role models, I might have done biomedical engineering, but I really didn't have it. But neurology, at least, was a language that seemed accessible to me. The problems of psychiatry were definitely the most interesting, and that was my draw, as I think it is for even most neurologists. What's higher mm -hmm. cortical function? How do we think? Why are we alive? What's consciousness? Every neurologist thinks about that. But when you get into the weeds to take care of people, you need a set of organizing principles. And psychiatry didn't have it, neurology did. Mm. I thought about being a neurosurgeon. Um, you have to love to operate under that amount of stress to want to do it. And I tried really hard. It wasn't for me. Um, maybe if there had been functional neurosurgery back then, I might have gravitated to it. So it's actually quite ironic um, to be working with neurosurgeons and at the beginning, you know, asking neurosurgeons to do something mm. that I can't do myself. So I think that the trajectory of my career has been in some ways confusion, collaboration, accidents. You know, how mm. do you keep trying to find the road to go where you're going, even though there's no map. And in mm. essence, it was how to create maps given evolving technology toward understanding something that seemed really interesting. So again, I mean, I think a lot of my interests started out as being more about curiosity. I really had, except that I was a doctor and I, take being a doctor very seriously, even though I don't officially practice neurology anymore. I really like being good at that. Mm. On the other hand, I think the best thing about being a good doctor and having good training is it helps you to understand the questions that haven't been answered. And again, scientists, by definition, are dissatisfied with the status quo. And I think all innovation is about pushing the status quo beyond where it is now. And mm. I think there are a lot of definitions. Paradigm shifts is when it really goes off the rails in the right direction. 
But most of the time, clinicians, scientists, we're all trying to get at a truth that we don't know where it really is. And we're trying to figure out how to at least be on the right road. The worst mm -hmm. thing, if you're trying to get to a destination, given that you know what the destination is, is to actually take the wrong turn off. Okay, mm -hmm. then you're really in trouble. But quite frankly, this is journey, not a destination. But in fact, you need to know approximately where we're going. And I think that kind of got me to neuron modulation. I was really, you know, when I started after neurology, I was going to be behavioral neurologist. And I was going to train in Boston with the preeminent behavioral neurologist of the 20th century, Norman Geshwin. It was all set up and he died in my last year of residency. And I did not have plan B. And plan B came to me because a neurosurgeon that was rotating with me, Bob Goodman, at Columbia in my neurology residency, had spent his MD PhD at Hopkins mapping opiate receptor and characterizing opiate receptors. And he told me about this new machine at Hopkins, a PET scanner that you could map chemicals. That was what my uncle did, but without the technology. And so, I moved to Hopkins to learn a new technology that could map the brain at a time when MRI was actually new. So we were barely using structural brain scanning. And here was this opportunity to do in vivo imaging. And I jumped at that. Hmm. And that's where my scientific career really took off and where the integration of my interests in behavior met a technology that could map what we were doing as neurologists. And I was studying epilepsy, except that Hopkins had the confluence of a group of people in neurology and neuropsychiatry that were interested in depression and neurological disease. Hmm. And I hooked up with Sergio Starkstein and Bob Robinson and Malin DeLong, who were all working together on neurological depression. And I had the scanner and they had the patients and they were doing the characterization. And that was really the start of basically accepting that you could not do everything, but that a team could work together with very, very different approaches to the same problem. Hmm. And you could be more than the sum of your parts. But those hmm. early days were can you get a depression signal in depression and neurological disease? And if you can't find it there, you have no business studying regular depression. So those early days was a fork in the road for me of epilepsy or depression. Mm -hmm. And it worked out there was a very, at, with those methods, a very clean signal across diagnoses where patients with depression shared the same metabolic PET scan pattern. And that's the direction I went into. I mean, I was doing lots of things. I thought of myself as a technology person. I was in a radiology department surrounded by people. I got advice, the most important advice of my career, besides my parents saying, just do whatever you want. We're, we'll back you up. But the best scientific advice I ever got was from Les Weiner, who was the chairman of neurology where I went to medical school, who dressed me down to tell me that I wasn't a nuclear physicist, I wasn't a radiochemist, I wasn't a radiologist, I was a neurologist. And when I told him what I was doing and all the different things, he says, what are you studying? He said, pick a problem. Right now, you will go deep with this PET scanning method wherever it will take you, and you will reach a point where that method is inadequate to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. You will own the topic, so pick the topic. That's why I'm a doctor who studies depression who happens to do neuromodulation now. I am mm -hmm. a neuromodulation expert. I am not an engineer. I am not a you know, new, you know, radiochemist or a electrophysiologist. I am a, 
well, used to be a decent experimentalist and methodologist with analyzing that kind of imaging data. Now I actually build models and think about how to use the tools to affect change in the patients that we've studied. So Hmm. long discussion, but I think it's pertinent because I do neuromodulation by accident. Once we had a map of depression, then the question was, how do treatments affect it? As we looked at how treatments affected it, we started to see patterns. That's a neurologist. That's pure neurology because that's interpretation. There was no AI. There was no unsupervised learning. There was no meta-analysis. There was pick your patients, have a hypothesis, test it, see what you get, and build these models, which were basically assembling regions that kept showing up. Mm-hmm. As you then saw the patterns and saw what kind of changes were necessary for recovery, then it became, again, coincidence. You know, I was moving. Mm-hmm. I'd already moved from Hopkins to Texas to join Peter Fox in a new PET scan facility. I was now exchanging being primarily in radiology to being back in neurology, but being in an imaging center that stood alone rather than in a department of radiology. And I got a great opportunity to move to Toronto as an endowed chair at a relatively young age and jumped and did it. Why did I move to Toronto? Who knows? It seemed like an interesting opportunity to, they had people who did depression. They had, I moved to the Rotman Research Institute, which was a consortium of imaging behavior experts, again, in a a very interested collaborative environment, kind of transdisciplinary, really before its time with a lot of freedom, but I needed my connections to neurology and psychiatry, which I had there. Mm. We could continue to do our work. And I had always been interested in neurosurgery and lesions and was casually introduced to Andres Lozano at a conference when I first got there. And the idea of why lesions were made for depression, but they didn't work very well. Singulotomies, subcaudic tractotomies. I, again, misidentified where those lesions were based on looking at pictures and books, but was interacting with people like Reese Cosgrove at Mass General, Scott Roush, Darren Doherty when he was a postdoc, and they had a group of singulotomy patients. So I'd always was paying attention to that work, except I couldn't reconcile why we'd make lesions where you made lesions. So always kind of just put neuromodulation onto the side. I was working in Toronto, had postdocs that were neurosurgeons that wanted advice about imaging. So I was following along the Parkinson's DBS work, and we were working on depression in the DBS patients. And the idea for if you, if you can modulate a circuit, if you know the circuit, well, we have a circuit and we modulate it. We know what needs to happen. And there are these people where they don't get better. What is that about? And we Mm -hmm. were building models of treatment resistance from all of our drug therapy experiments with imaging. And if you keep seeing a pattern and you suddenly see that there's another treatment around, everything about our first experiments was totally a lark, totally opportunistic. And obviously, you know, you don't do DBS for the first time in your basement, Mm -hmm. but in fact, it was pretty casual. It wasn't casual to get it started. It wasn't casual to do it, but the idea was pretty casual because we were there, we were in the environment. Mm. Best thing that ever happened was that I was in Toronto to have the idea. If I had been in the United States, I never would have acted on it. Too hard, activation Mm. energy, too much. FDA, industry, access, 
in Toronto, approved devices can be used to stimulate the brain, dead stop. Hmm. We even have a socialized healthcare system. Andres had permission with IRB approval to do pilot studies for an NF5. I brought him an idea and learned that. I got a little grant to support it, but certainly didn't need it to fund it. Hmm. The impediments to try something new with a collaborator that was an expert that knew this. We were not taking chances. We knew where in the brain we wanted to go. I had someone who knew how to do this procedure and knew we could do it safely. We had an expert psychiatrist, Sir Kennedy, to support our efforts. But this was a neurosurgery project. And mm. we knew what we wanted to do. We made a very modest experiment for safety and we put it in and turned it on and saw what happened because we were just trying to turn down area 25. It's all we were trying to do. That seemed to be important and that's what we wanted to do. And if it didn't work, we would know why because we did all these scans, we did all this other work and we made our best approximation in patients, took a year to get the first patient. Nobody wanted to send a patient. And that was the start of it, but it was totally following the evidence, even though there was really no map, but there was opportunity. And there was collaboration of people who were willing to jump and take a chance together, which I think is the essential pieces of all of this. I mean, there has to be an idea. There. It has to be a salesman, I guess. You've got to convince people to do something. But for me, it's about following the evidence. And this is where the evidence said it had to be tested. What I never did the calculation on was what I would do if it worked. Because no experiment that I'd ever done or ever read had thought about a non-existent endpoint. Never. You're only trying to make sure you don't hurt somebody, that mm. something doesn't go wrong. You set up experimentally a null hypothesis. Now we have to think about it totally different because it's no longer just a null hypothesis. It's what do we do next? Because once it's in, unless you take it out, it's in. So you actually have an infinite experiment. How do you leverage that? How do you mm. learn from that? How do you iterate on that? is kind of where we are. But I think the, the, the trajectory that we are now is everything I just described, which obviously it wasn't an accident, but if I'm really honest about it, it sort of was. Mm. Very, very interesting. And the patients that you're talking about when with depression, you're usually talking about the patients with treatment resistant depression that have been on multiple trials of other drug treatments or even even um, other forms perhaps of non-invasive uh, neuromodulation. Um, uh, and, and this is a sort of, the, as a, and, and, you know, uh, uh, um, electroconvulsive therapy as well, perhaps. So, uh, there's a huge unmet need as well. So it'd be interesting to understand, like, as a person that's dealt with depression for many years now, you, I've heard you talk elsewhere about the, I think the, the biological sort of conception of depression. And, uh, and can you talk a little bit about how you think about people that have perhaps two two people that have perhaps one of them uh, both both of them say severe depression, but one of them is responsive to a relatively standard treatment, say an SSRI, and the other one is apparently completely immune to SSRI and and and, uh, and other therapeutic approaches, and and so a kind of person that's more likely to, to sort of rock up at your door. How do you how do you think about it as a clinician and as a scientist about what's what's going on in the brain from a, from a sort of biological perspective and and how we should sort of think about these people on the continuum of treatment responsive to treatment resistant? So this has come from really this body of work that started 1997, you know, in in Texas where we were scanning depressed people and noticed first we wanted just the map of depression, then we treated people with fluoxetine, with Prozac, and looked at what changed and kind of 
explored what was the difference for people who got better and people who didn't get better. And that's when we first identified our first biomarker, which was the rostral anterior cingulate. Mm -hmm. Everybody had frontal hypometabolism, but the people who went on to get better had high activity in the rostral cingulate. And the people who failed to respond to the treatment had low activity. And there was nothing about them clinically that was different. And we replicated this a few times and other people replicated it. But the idea that you could look the same or that your clinical symptoms, you know, again, depression, everybody loves to say, oh, it's really hard. It's a heterogeneous disorder. Well, when you don't have a pathological basis known, you equally could take a neurological point of view and say, look, we don't know the lesion. We are meeting people not at the origin of their depression, but at their failure of their brain to adapt to whatever mm -hmm. the instigator is. Obviously, it's bad to have bad genes. It's really bad to have a, a hostile early environment. It's bad to have ongoing stress and inflammation. I mean, there are all kinds of things we can correlate, but we really have no evidence that we don't start out as a single problem in a network of brain regions and their dynamical interaction. And you're just looking at failure to adapt because people can adapt in different ways. So this identifying a brain metabolic state that could be in two states in people with the same problem that predicted not anything about how they look, but how they did to a treatment was a first, I think, important insight. It then became, well, some people get better on drug and some people get better on therapy. If you start to look at people when they've never been treated for anything, and randomized them to the two most common treatments. It was a work with at Emory, which was basically the third iteration of the drug CVT experiments that we did in Toronto, but to do it from your first presentation for treatment, that we identified a very robust biomarker, both with PET and fMRI, that can predict at your presentation if you will respond, be in remission, or totally fail drug and or therapy. And it turns out that it's not different signals. It's the same, we forced the analysis to tell us the same set of brain regions that can be in opposing states that can predict one of two roads that you should take to get better. And when you're better, your brain doesn't change exactly the same. So you, we've learned that these biotypes Actually, the people that we've been able to track, and we can't track people indefinitely, those experiments are really self-limited. <clears throat> but those signals don't seem to change. So you have, you may actually have a biotype you bring to your first episode, and treatments change the stability in your behavior, but may not correct the underlying problem or mm -hmm. correct all of the adaptations that you can't go home again. There is no normal. And I think the idea and an organizing principle of everything I think about now is everything is about good and bad adaptation. Now we call it plasticity, mm -hmm. you know, and we've got all kinds of biology of synaptic homeostatic plasticity. But in fact, we're always changing. We're always adapting. And the same with people with depression. So. There is a continuum. There are the symptoms that bother people, but that is really maybe actually orthogonal to actually the state of the brain. That's why it's never worked to match a treatment to a set of clinical symptoms, but that hasn't stopped the field from continuing to try. Hmm. On the other hand, if you look at different treatments in terms of how people do, then you start to get pragmatic about matching people to the treatment that will get them at least out of the episode. And then you're in a position to know, where did I move you? Because that's your new normal. We are a dynamical system. And this is the other mm -hmm. thing I have only really recently, relatively recently appreciated. It's all a dynamical 
equilibrium and we move through states all the time. And that when you reach a point where you can no longer adapt and that every compensatory pathway that you have in your brain to compensate for a stressor or whatever destabilizes how mood impacts action, which is what depression is, you're in really bad trouble. It makes a lot of sense that if you then take a neuromodulation technology, you're basically trying to shift states. Mm. But you really need to know the state of the brain to know how to best shift it. And mm. that's why I think when you look at things like TMS, you can move people out of a state if their brain is amenable to that movement. In the same way, you may want therapy and not drug or vice versa, but you will get better not on your preference, but in the state of the brain that you come to treatment. I think it's the same at every stage of this illness. It's a chronic illness for the people who have, I think, real depression and yeah. not a single stress response. So TRD is just being in the ultimate attractor state. Mm -hmm. You cannot adapt. All of your alternative pathways are offline. And so moving in subcortically probably matches the biology. And we're spending a lot of time with Ki Sung Choi, our imaging lead at Sinai, to really kind of line up what is the order that these pathways naturally break down. This is no different than looking at why do some people with a carotid occlusion get a stroke and some people not get a stroke? What is their collateral circulation? What is their mm. microvasculature? What is the adaptation that they can do until you can adapt? And then the brain dies. I think this is the same. And I think all of these neuromodulation strategies need these brain state markers to actually know what's best for a given person. Mm. So with one of the differences between um, neuromodulation as compared to say a drug is the, the immense sort of space of, of different parameterizations that are possible for any uh, given device. Whereas arguably with a, with a drug, you've got only perhaps one or two dimensions along which you can change. You can change the, the dose perhaps, and, and maybe you could change the, the frequency of administration or something, although perhaps there's an equivalence there at some level. Whereas with neuromodulation systems, there are often, let's say in a deep brain stimulation system, millions of different possible uh, 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 parameterizations that could uh, be given to it. Is, it, it, it. is that necessary for this? Are there so many different forms of depression that we need a system that's able to sort of almost infinitely um, explore perturbations of the dynamical system or or is or, or is there do you think there's some sort of subspace of this um, that, that will be a sort of standard programmable interface as it were for depressed people if that makes any sense so I think it's a really interesting and fundamental philosophical question okay because you can argue both ways the question is can you set up the experiments and prove who's right so just with that caveat in mind, because I don't want to sound dogmatic, a second kind of disclaimer, I hate complexity, personally. I really hate it. And I think, you know, finding an elegant solution that's only as complicated as it needs to be as the goal, as opposed to a solution that's as, as infinitely complicated and mm. sort of gets caught up in the complexity is where the discussions now are on. I think that if you have all infinite choices, you never make one. You know, mm. there's kinds of people. I mean, my husband, Kevin, I mean, he walks into the store, he sees what he wants, he buys it, he's gone. I always have to feel the need to fight my inner demon that if I need a pair of pants, I got to walk through every department until I find and look at all the choices, even if I come back to only one. I think that we all scientifically want to make sure we don't miss something. And medically, we always want to make sure we don't miss things. On the other hand, once you get a clue and it behaves as not such a complex system, 
Hmm. Don't try to make it more complicated because simple seems lame. Simple is good. And if you add what is the pragmatic need in this space, you have to scale. It has to be affordable. Everybody that's reasonably competent that wants to do it should be trainable to do it. It shouldn't take too much time. All the things that are killing the field in Parkinson's right now, too much complexity, too much choice. Hmm. will kill this before it comes out of the gate. Now, if the evidence is that simplicity is inadequate, then you ramp up the complexity. But a goofy first guess using parameters to change state with a single frequency isn't perfect, but works pretty well. And mm -hmm. if you can have people doing it in a simple-minded way, keeping parameters relatively, well, totally stable and focusing attention on another parameter that also can have reduced complexity, namely the where you stimulate, mm -hmm. rather than the how you stimulate, you can move toward a process where you eliminate some of the variability and that's just is again that um tempers my own nervousness quite frankly i like having not a million variables always in play at the same time and hoping a machine will resolve it for me maybe that's being a control freak but i like if i think i'm like every other clinician if someone's going to develop a tool. I want a set of instructions and I don't want too many choices. And I think mm. that's how we practice medicine because we, that's how we scale. It's not, it shouldn't just be limited to people who, who have access to the complexity. And it turns out that that's probably 80% good enough. And then we can spend our time on the part that isn't good enough, which may not be for the reason that we think. It mm. may be that a lot of other adjustments is because just like how do people devolve to be in a very local attractor in TRD, as they come out of it, they're back to a state that may not be familiar, but is just another state that may have other issues that may actually explain some of the variability that people have. And it isn't trying to keep tuning the original problem. It may be tuning something new in mm. the new state. So I think that complexity needs to be added and subtracted at different times. And I think if we start at the very beginning as though all things are possible, I'm sure that's true. And if we had enough data, like any big data model, we could figure it out. But none of us have enough data. And if the only way you have more data is to have more electrodes in the brain, no, you still just have a lot of data on one person. And I think, again, if we're trying to scale, we want to find, is there something in common we can do? That's a testable hypothesis. And I banked my team banked a big experiment to prove that that was true and we proved it's true or at least it's true enough to develop that theme that everybody doesn't need something different that if you can characterize the patients and we have variability in the patients we operate on but they all have failed a lot of things and they're all stuck sad and can't move they can't move mentally Mm. They, in many cases, feel as though they can't move physically. They can't get out of the attractor. And you stimulate in one place, in everybody, exactly the same, and everybody moves out of the attractor. Where they move to the next state is what's different. That has to now be characterized. That's a new state. Mm. To keep them? Our goal is to keep them from going back to where we started. Now the question is how you get keep them moving 
toward whatever goal they're in and how to avoid other obstacles, mental, mm. environmental, and by characterizing your brain. I think that's an ongoing process and that's where the complexity now comes in. Mm. So would you say in, in your experience from, you know, the, the sort of the, on the engineering side of things in terms of the, the devices, we've gone from a sort of situation of monopolar leads and relatively simple um, interfaces to now a situation where there's directional leads and um, temporal patterning now possible with certain systems like Boston Scientific's or size system. Do you think, are we, are we in, a, in a situation where we're increasing complexity kind of in a fairly blind and sort of slightly wild way? Well, I, I always feel as though I'm a combination curmudgeon critic, mostly of myself, because you always have to make decisions. I think that it is fantastic to have all of these technology evolutions happening now at the same time. I think it makes it very hard for scientists because it's kind of like going into the bakery and trying to figure out which pastry you want to get. You kind of want one of each because you want them for different reasons. And I think just like any technology, companies need to compete. I get that. Companies need to make decisions about what they think their customers want. They need to read the tea leaves on where's the science going and build things that people will use and that they can support. I think the being able to do at the beginning a single lead, monopolar stim, making the adjustments, figuring out what people did in Parkinson's was the revolution that changed the world. Hmm. I think that realizing, particularly in psychiatry, that it's not a gray matter target. It's a circuit. It's a white matter mm -hmm. target. It's the places that whether you come from the view of a lesion or you come from the view like we did of the, a derivative from other experiments to an area, you have a net. The targets are a network, not a node. And that you need directionality. I mean, we've worked with Cameron McIntyre and Brian Howell and his team to build Allison Waters did all of the electrophysiology to basically come up with contortions of physical models to stimulate on conventional leads, to stimulate one, one pathway over another when we know we stimulate four. You don't need to do that. You can now use a directional lead, do some pre-planning with tractography and mm -hmm. know how to isolate tracks. Having a system that would let you work out that maybe for us the cingulant bundle needs to be stimulated differently different time maybe i should stimulate the cingulant bundle first and when i have when my ephys signal changes i add forceps minor maybe i need to get the sub subcortical tracks first and i need a very very precise kind of way to reset it and then i move to just do cortical stim i don't know I do know that if we stimulate all of them all at the same time, I get a fast effect and then I get a slow effect. Maybe the reason, well, we published this, you know, a few months ago in the nature paper of Shankar Alagapin's paper, that what predicted time to stable electrophysiology was the abnormalities in the white matter in the circuit we, we stimulated. Maybe that's a clue that we ought to be stimulated different pathways differently, and the tools of the technology will help us do that. The problem is, what I really read right now is what I had experimentally is that I can beam the signal to home base so that the patient doesn't have to come in to tell me how their brain is doing. Mm. I used to be able to do that. I can't do that anymore. But now I have a commercial device. So companies need to make decisions that aren't in a vacuum, but that are not synchronized with the state of science. And that that's hard. And that's, I don't envy the companies, even though I'm dependent on them. Mm. And if you work with one, you wish that one of the others would 
adopt a technology that was successful with the other team, but I'm not naive and I realize business doesn't work that way. People make their educated guesses um, in business. But I think that the science tells us we need all of the above in every device. We need flexibility. We need to be able to people put people in a MRI scanner. If you're gonna have this for the rest of your life, starting at age 30, you will get cancer. You will need uh, other things. We need to have your brain technology not undermine taking care of you medically. We need to have steerability. We need to have ways that we can do what we already know and add easily. I think that progress, real progress, where people are well, reframes what we want to do next and what we want the technology to help us do. I don't want to have to start at ground zero. Hmm. A, I can't. I've got to take care of the people I have. I'm not going to take out their devices to do my next experiment that may not go well. I need to figure out how to add on to what I'm already doing. You know, that's that's a hard ask. That's a necessary next step. Because mm. I think that now with people's brain signal that we have is stable, but when they become unstable, maybe it's not that they have their original problem, something has evolved. It's not a side effect. It's not a failure of what we're doing. Mm. It's life and their brain evolving. And we need a way to read it out. And But I don't want to instrument everybody with a helmet of um, or a million electrodes in their brain for a problem I don't know they will have because that's not practical either. But I know right now I need more than I've got and I've got to be, teams got to be clever to figure out what is the most rational, ethical, um, fundable, safe next step. Gotcha. You mentioned um, earlier on that um, one of the sort of pioneering areas was Parkinson's disease and, and perhaps essential tremor even before that, um, where where these systems were shown to be effective at, at controlling symptoms. Arguably, one of the things that made that sort of more tractable in that circumstance was that you certainly with tremor and some other symptoms get a very rapid clinical response once you start stimulation and. One of the things you mentioned in, in a review, this review article is that actually with, with depression and, and maybe OCD as well, but certainly with depression, the, the reaction time, as it were, the response time of the, and maybe this is logical because we're traversing the, the, some kind of terrain in a tractor space, um, but, the, uh, but the, 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 the latency between a, a, a change in your stimulation and, and the clinical response can be quite significant weeks, weeks even months. And so it'd be, could you talk a little bit about the, the practical challenges there and, and what you think uh, uh, possible solutions might look like? So I think that that's, you know, a big part of it that, you know, having a biomarker that tells you you're doing fine, even though the patient doesn't know it yet and you don't have the clinical readout, I think is where we all live right now. And I think it is our justification for trying to build these closed loop models of acute changes. I think the thing that's emerging in psychiatry is the acute effects are definitely not the chronic effects. And a lot of times the acute effects are actually side effects. And I think in OCD, this is emerging. It's certainly becoming clear in the work of Martin Figui and our group here um, with Brian Capel. I mean, there everyone is moving an OCD away from stimulating the nucleus accumbens, where you get this big, rapid mood effect. That turns out to be really interesting, but everybody ends up stimulating chronically more posterior in the internal capsule to where you get that effect and that you can get better um, without ever seeing that kind of elation effect, mm -hmm. whether acute or with an adjustment. But it's really interesting. It has a very important biology. It's relevant to lots of things, but it may not be necessary 
for recovery. So, you know, again, in Parkinson's, there's the tremor effect, but there's also things that evolve more slowly as well. But the pragmatics of tuning is with having something you can see. So depression mm. is much more like dystonia. So having a biomarker is essential. And I'll tell you that, you know, again, it took, took a while to get the um, first biomarker paper published this year. We've already have a replication sample. And so we've put our biomarker into action. And part of our NIH grant that funded that, the milestone was to actually test the biomarker in parallel against Dr. Figui. You know, mm -hmm. what's his decision and what does the biomarker say you should do? You know, the problem is our biomarker wasn't acting in real time. So mm -hmm. Shankar had to analyze it quickly. But when you looked at the decision tree, it's really amazing to watch a really great psychiatrist who knows how to do this treatment like Patricio Rifapose did in Atlanta. They know how to do it. They don't need a biomarker, but that doesn't scale to new people. Hmm. To watch going from making a decision clinically to waiting to see what the brain says. So even with a slow change, using the biomarker to know the state of the brain. So I think building those models of wellness and seeing these trajectories is helpful, even without the clinic. Now, it does get into, I think, a really critical question. Well, but we still need to make decisions about when to make adjustments, and patients do need feedback. You can't just tell a patient, oh, just be patient. Your brain's in the right state when you still feel terrible, mm. or you're not able to do what you want to do. And that may be us, and that may be you. And your circumstances and we don't know how to discriminate as we said in the paper depression from distress hmm. you know, and we think our biomarker is helping us and we're making decisions and it's working but i think we need some other tools and i think that's where there are other ways we can track behavior and maybe these more important behaviors by not having to have it be in the brain which is super hard takes a super long time, is only for specialists. Whereas we have the whole world working on movement, working on autonomics, working on wearables, working on video. And as you know, I mean, we've invested a lot of energy in our own team, as you have, to thinking about how you can combine biomarkers of behavior that are external to the brain. And then if you're really good, you can link the brain signal to the behavioral signal. And my, you know, aspiration is how do we get to where we have it in our patients, all the different layers of biomarkers, but we can take a biomarker that doesn't require an invasive brain readout, hmm. but we have it surrogate. We have a real biomarker of the actual biology that we can use to track patients and see their recovery or their stumble in their trajectory of illness with whatever treatment you have, non-invasive neuromod, different mm. kinds of DBS, um, knowing when someone with ketamine is decaying before they do, um, mm. when to restart TMS. There should be biomarkers that don't require a scanner but should be informed by scans and that you should be able to have a tracking device that you can take on or off or that you can record and have a model tell you what your state is. And it's very clear that video and wearables will help us do that. They already are in Parkinson's. We published that our face movement signal did as well in terms of determining when the brain had reached a stable state and it was way better than talking to the patient. Let the patient tell you in their own words through their own video diaries. There's such rich data to be mined and the world has built models. Let's use what's available in AI to help us take care of people. And I think we're at the cusp of a real 
revolution in that, that I think can combine the brain with these other very accessible tools if we line up our science right. Hmm. Very interesting. And so how are you yourself trying to sort of integrate um, AI and, and sort of big data into your approaches? I think that we have little amounts of big data. So I, I use the word loosely, but I think, you know, we, we collect video diaries on patients. Um, what patients will say to themselves is very different from what they will say to the research coordinator, mm. the psychiatrist, the psychologist, me, their friends, but that people in a routine, what they say to themselves is extremely interesting. And Steve Heisek on the team has really been exploring that. It's a big data question because a five minute video diary with all of the features of prosody and face movement and natural language is incredibly mm -hmm. rich. And if a patient agrees to record and you have a way to handle that data, you have massive amounts of data. So you were believers, as much as I would love to have thousands of patients, I'll settle for small groups with dense multimodal data and mm. we'll see which are keeper signals and which are, gee, that was fun, but that's not going to scale. So I think AI has sort of set me free. I was not, I was a slow adopter in some ways because my work has always been about a hypothesis and test it. The world has changed. And, but I think that the adage, if I read the literature right, is garbage in, garbage out, that you can't, my grandmother could make a meal out of garbage, but um, not, not here. Um, I think that we have to collect data in a very rigorous way and then find ways with data that is privileged, that is private, that we can leverage the tools that are available um, with machine learning and computer vision and AI and deep learning and all these things in responsible and meaningful ways, but it's going to take a concerted effort to make sure that we're doing operations on data that's meaningful. And so I think there's gonna be this ongoing collaborative, bi-directional interaction between big data models and little data sources. Build the model. I had a graduate student, um, Sahara Sarati, who worked on the face when we were at um, in Atlanta. And again, you know, her assignment was build one model with unsupervised, an, you know, an unsupervised model, and then to do a transfer function model. And she used a model for prosody from Google and actors to look at our videos. But I think there's this, we're learning. And the real frustration is when you have small numbers of patients, how to be smart enough and forecast, foresee what might be on the horizon so that you collect the right data that you can mine it after the mm. fact. We have gone back and continue to mine our imaging data from Emory. Ki Sung Choi is, is a wizard that we ask hypotheses and go back from old data because we were thinking about how this might be a continuum of experiments and have continued to both keep the collaborations, which are important to me, but also not lose the preciousness of the data sources because things we learned in never treated depressed people, those signals can be looked at in the TRD patients and we can get insights. So I think it's the same with all these kinds of data we can collect and then we can utilize big data models that are available in the world because nobody can do it themselves. Absolutely. And so we, we started this conversation um, talking about how you got into um, neuromodulation you, yourself and, and you mentioned a number of interesting points about 
how much sort of serendipity and, and chance events were, were responsible for it. But if you were advising somebody now who say is in their, I don't know, so for more year of university and thinking about what they want to major in and, 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 and what they want to do afterwards, where would you, if you were talking to your young self, your, your own so for more, where do you, do you think you would be um, directing yourself or focusing if you were looking at entering this field uh, nowadays? It's a hard question because, again, you can never go home again. You know, um, it's really hard not to do, but we all know the forks in our own roads where we should have gone left rather than right. And I'm, yeah. my mother taught me to be an optimist or to make um, lemonade out of lemons. So I think with that caveat, I think what I find when I talk to young people and I get a lot of you know cold calls we meet people because again when you're a hybrid you attract everybody to kind of know how did you do it everybody sees themselves in someone who's a hybrid you know i enjoy i probably have accomplished my goal because i never figured i belonged really anywhere it's because you belong everywhere that hmm. there is no neurology or psychiatry there are skill sets that you must do, but there are languages that you learn. And mm -hmm. I think the important message for people starting out interested in these very complex problems is to look in the mirror and to really know what language you like to speak. Just like I had this in my mind's eye, I should be a neurosurgeon. What the hell, I had no business being a neurosurgeon. My dad apparently, wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I mean, it turned out I learned when we were doing DBS for depression that my dad had actually gotten into a neurosurgery program because he was interested in psychosurgery for schizophrenia and then mm -hmm. thought otherwise, got married. So that was a revelation. He would have been a terrible neurosurgeon. I mean, it, I mean, it just, that wasn't what he was meant to be, mm -hmm. but he thought he was. Same with me. I think same with a lot of people. We have an idea of what seems like what we want to do rather than looking at not just what are we good at, but where's our aptitude. And I mm. think in neuroscience, how is it that can be people who look at what I do and go, I could not do that. And I look at what they do, an organoid, a, you know, cell, you know, I look at people like Yuri Bizaki. I, I just admire, and I have no idea what he's talking about most of the time but I sure wish I understood it. You know, there, there's the language that you think you have aptitude to learn. And I think, when, but I think a branch of, do you wanna be a doctor or not? I actually wonder sometimes if I would have been better not being a doctor. Not, I wish I could have been an artist, but kind of what we do is sort of a kind of artistic expression and creative expression. So I'll kind of just own that but that decision tree about being a doctor or non-doctor i think if the technology was what it is now i would never have been a clinician would never have been a clinician would i have been an engineer not sure um i wish i'd taken engineering hmm. but then again i wish i had paid more attention to reading eegs as a neurologist i hated that i just couldn't get it but I sure understood how to look at a three-dimensional brain immediately. So that was an aptitude. So I like behavior. I did not like that language of psychiatry. I do not like description. I am not a philosopher. Mm -hmm. I don't like theory. I like data and organizing data. So I think young people should say, why do you want to be a doctor? What I tell mm -hmm. people is, imagine you don't get to do science. What kind of patients do you want to sit in an office and see every day for 12 hours a day? Mm -hmm. That's how you'll decide. You can't look at me or anybody who's mid-career, senior in their career and go, oh, that looks easy. No, none of it was easy, but it was following things that seemed fun and interesting. But I... If I'm really honest with myself, I would not have been a doctor. And I think I avoided um, having my research 
take care of patients until I jumped in to do the DDS. I was a third person investigator. Other people took care of patients. I asked the questions. I could scrutinize and think about the clinical problem. And I think, as my father always told me, have questions matter. So a clinician knows where people are suffering, sees where what you have to offer, it just falls short. Hmm. I think that became the superpower for the direction of what I cared about. But that even though I, I didn't really know where we were going, but it was totally informed by my dissatisfaction clinically. Hmm. I don't know. Well, there would be hopefully a field that now I could look at and go, I want to solve this by being an engineer, being a scientist. I don't want to, I don't want to spend my time going to medical school to learn about the stomach and bones when I care about the brain. I probably would have gotten a PhD, mm -hmm. didn't. So I think time is the enemy. Time is the enemy of our experiments now. Time is, well, I just had a birthday, so I really think about time. Um, that time is what we don't have enough of, and time, even early on, you don't realize what you spend time on. So there's lots to figure out here. So do the part that if that's all you could do, that's what you do, and and go deep on that. Sounds like some some good advice. Well, Helen. It only remains for me to say thank you very, very much for giving us your valuable time to talk about some of these really fascinating areas and, and, and an area in which, in particular, you've been a pioneer that of treatment-resistant depression. It's a great pleasure and honor to, to speak to you about that. And, and I look forward to catching up again soon. Okay. Well, you owe me a visit in New York. And Absolutely. thank you for the opportunity to um, muse, um, hopefully, um, it wasn't, um, it was useful. I enjoyed talking with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Likewise.